All right, um, about time to start here. So um, let's go ahead and get going. Um, let's see, let me go and show my screen. Oops, maybe not yet. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff planned to um, try and cover here today. So if you will, you know, feel free to, if you have questions or things to shout them out or chat them out in the chat room. Um, so um, I'll probably, I'm gonna, my biggest plan, I mean, as usual for these help sessions, um, I'm not gonna be doing so much lecturing as going over the questions and, and assignment problems and things like that. So, um, so I'll, I'll come back to assignment two, but a uh, quick, um, I want to point out that there was a mistake um, on assignment two, the question, uh, part three of question four. So if, if you had downloaded that before, like today, before about noon today, uh, you might have had the, the version that's actually kind of impossible to answer. So you might want to check that out. So anyway, there's an announcement about that. Um, we'll go over assignment two here. So uh, I thought I would I would uh, talk a little bit about assignment one first. Um, so my my normal plan for these sessions is yeah talk about the solutions that were posted for the the previous week's assignment. Um, so there was a solution posted for the assignment one, um, um, and then um, probably talk about assignment two, and then maybe talk more in general about the. Um, um, the, the readings and the other materials uh, as well, kind of after we go through the assignments and stuff. So, um, actually, I'm probably not going to spend a whole lot of time on assignment one. So, um, I'm, I'm going to, I mean, nobody really had any problems with the number of conversion, I don't think, um, besides, you know, a typo here or there, that kind of thing, a calculation mistake. So, um, Nobody really had a problem with, with 12 um, because, well, you know, I, I don't, we, we mentioned last time kind of the hint that you need on this is, is you really have to understand the, um, the um, format for the IAS uh, computer, right? So, uh, for example, the figure 1.7 gives us in our textbook. Um, although also, you know, I'll point out that, you know, it's useful to be able to understand kind of how to um, translate uh, between hexadecimal notation uh, and binary notation, um, or in particular, or, or here, it's, it's useful to understand, for example, that uh, uh, each hexadecimal digit uh, directly translates to four bits. So, I mean, if, if you know that, then you know that it, you know we, we could have shown you on this problem um, our textbook instead of giving you the contents of a um, so this is going to end up being you know each each digit um, hexadecimal digit is going to translate to four bits so we can directly see that if we count up the digits here there's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten there's ten digits right so that implies that this is representing 40 bits of information or, or a 40 bit pattern right um which um I have to remember um which corresponds to the ias uh, machine here right so it's 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 basically using a 40 bit word for the memory which is Strange by today's standards, we, as we meant, as I mentioned last time, you know, we pretty much standardize onto eight-bit words. So every word in memory has eight bits. But um, they use forty bits. This is one of the first um, von Neumann um, architecture computers. But you know, the the, the first eight bits or the first two hex characters. Are going to represent the opcode, and then the next uh, three characters, which is 12 bits, are an instruction, right? And they decided to pack in two opcode instructions uh, into each word because they didn't really have that many instructions. So if they and, and they didn't have that much memory to address, right? So by the way, um, 
I, I don't remember if, if our textbook, uh, yeah, well, our, our textbook did talk about it. So there was only 4,096 instructions, uh, storage locations. So that was the, the size of addressable memory. So presumably memory was addressed from zero to 4,095, right? Um, so, so how many bits does that uh, imply that you need in order to be able to have a memory address that um, can address 4,096 storage areas. So, um, yeah, keep asking, you know, requests about, um, um, uh, and, 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 you know, I'll get to them. So somebody's asking a request about, oh, the supplementary assignment. So. So um, yeah, I'll talk about that. Maybe I'll talk about that next. So, so I gave kind of a supplement to be done on assignment one here using the IAS computer here. So, all right. Um, so, so my question is, um, and feel free anybody to, to kind of type it out or shout it out. So how many bits do you need to um, address 4,096 storage locations? Do I know? Um, just a video over to something. Just tell me. And again, somebody was answering. Do you need 40 bits? Um, no, it's not 40 bits. So 40 bits would imply that you could address two raised to the power of 40, uh, which is a lot more than 4,096. to the 40. So, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of giving a hint here, but um, um, the number of bits you have, so, you know, it, 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 we, we talked about, I mean, you know, or that you should be able to, to understand this because, for example, for four bits, you can represent how many different addresses. Four bits allow you to go from 0000, 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 10, 0, so on, up to 1111. So you could use four bits to represent addresses zero, one up to 15 or um, F hexadecimal, right? So two to the 40, you know, two to the 32 um, were, is what 32 bit architecture machines use. And that's basically a four, a four gigabyte address, addressable memory. Right? So my question, so, so, um, so, so how many bits would we need to represent, to, to be able to address 4,096 storage locations? Two to 12, so many answered, so, um, which is right. So two, two to the power of 10, uh, you can represent 1,024 things. Two to the 11 is twice that, 2,048. And two to the 12 is 4,096, twice again that size. Right. Um, so anyway, but uh, then that makes sense if you understand the relationship with that. So that's why they use 12 bits for the addresses in here, because there was only a total of 12 bits or 4,096 4, um, addressable locations in the IAS system. So. Right. So, um, so anyway, that allows you um, some things. So somebody asked me about, I mean, just kind of in general, um, because I, I mean, I guess they were complaining about the, you know, how would you know to write this assembly language program? You know, so this is, this is different than like uh, Intel assembly, but you know, uh, two, our, our two, Prerequisite courses are about programming, uh, um, uh, about programming in general. So learning to program, that's five one five, and then five one six is about um, uh, organization, and, and we do assembly stuff in there, right? So anyway, I mean, you know, it is a prerequisite. It is a um, assumption that we have in a course here. If you are admitted into the program, that 
I mean, you're familiar with the basic concepts of writing an assembly program and the basic concepts maybe of, for example, how you would um, actually write a compiler or, or how a compiler would take something um, um, like the pseudocode I had in the example solution here uh, and translate that, assemble that, um, uh, or compile that down into uh, assembly or machine language, right? So um, anyway, so I'll get to the, uh, the, the part B here. So. But, uh, but yeah, for these then, I mean, really all you had to do was um, for each one of these addresses, you had to take the first two characters and look that up um, in the uh, other table. So the first two characters um, for the, the first one here were a one. Um, and then of course the, the address was zero FA, but, but um, zero one, or our first two characters here, and then you had to, you know, look that up. So that would be, you know, four zeros followed by four ones. That's so that's a load instruction. So that's that's transfer um, from some memory address to the accumulator, where the memory address then is the next twelve bits, which can address one of those locations in our uh, in the IAS's four thousand ninety six size memory. Right? Uh, and then twenty one, of course, is going to be the bit pattern zero zero one zero is the two. 0001 is the one, so that should be a store. Um, that, right? well, I think I, when I did this myself personally, I kind of gave the hex for each one of these to make it uh, easy then to, um, um, more easy to, to directly look up the, the hex, uh, hexadecimal opcode um, for each one of these. All right. So, um, like I said in my announcement, you know, um, it was obvious that most people did not really do the the uh, the second problem here. So we're just getting um, a, a solution that somebody already worked out, right? I mean, there's more than one way to do it. I mean, there's an infinite number of ways to actually solve this, right? So, I mean, it, it's easy to come up with your own solution or it should be, I mean, you know, you should have the background where you, you know how to program, you know, the general idea of kind of how machines work at assembly language level um, and how you translate things. So, and kind of an answer to um, my, the request already about the supplementary uh, part. I mean, there, you have to do something pretty similar to um, the, the stuff, the examples, well, the, the, the solution from the solution manual, but also the example solution here. So, um, so I don't know if I'll, I mean, you know, I won't spend too much time on part A. So, you know, if, if you're using this exact equation, um, you just have to um, multiply n times, you know, it's, it's a, a sequence of, of arithmetic expression. So, so if you do a multiplication and then a division, or well, so, so the way that I showed breaking it up in here, we, we do an addition, so we have n plus one. So now we've got two values that, that give us n and n plus one. So we can then do a multiplication and we have that value squared, uh, squirreled away somewhere. Um, and then once we have that value, we need to do a division by two. Then the result of that gives you the result of summing the series here, right? This is, this is I, I maybe should have added kind of symbols on here to make it even look more like assembly. So. So here, I mean, uh, in this example, we're, I'm kind of, I'm, I didn't do it as efficiently as we possibly could. Uh, so there's some redundancy here, but you know, so we define a, a location to hold N um, and then I have another location to hold M. So, so you know, this is, this is my location to hold N. Um, I, I just assign memory address 1000 to hold N. Um, And then I need another location to hold the, um, um, the value one. 
uh, because we we don't have instructions like um, add a um, so IAS was very primitive. So compared to um, like a modern ARM uh, architecture that we'll talk about ARM assembly or um, Intel um, I eighty six uh, or x eighty six assembly, um, uh, the the instruction set is very primitive, right? So for example, in, in modern Intel or ARM, there's gonna be things like add, uh, instead of you know, so all, all the instructions we had, you had to provide a memory address to add to the accumulator. But you know, there, there's other instructions like where you can provide something that's like a literal constant. So, so instead of having to store one in here to do the add, you, know, you could just say add, and then the, 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 the portion of, of the um, opcode uh, is interpreted as, a literal integer value, but anyway. So for 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 this machine, you know, we, we have to have one out there somewhere so that we can add that in. And in this case, you know, for example, I do that. The, the result always goes back into the accumulator for these IAS instructions. So that's another difference for more modern assemblies. So you can have instructions that do calculations that uh, instead of storing them back into a register, store them directly back out to a memory location or things like. That. Um, so anyway, then, you know, um, for example, we could push that back out to um, the location M here, um, which was 1000, which I had assigned to 1003. And then to perform the N times N, we, um, you know, I've already got M in the accumulator. So like I said, I'm not doing it as efficient, efficiently as possible. I'm trying to do it more as if we were writing a dumb compiler that just directly translates these lines one by one and does the safest thing so that it can, it can translate the next line without doing any optimizations to look for unnecessary loads or stores or things. Well, anyway, yeah, I mean, you know, um, we can load our in back in and multiply them by, by the M, which has N plus one and store that back out to the value that's holding the numerator um, and so on. So I'll just kind of leave it at that, all right? Um, but we can do the same process if we have to do this as a loop instead of using an exact equation where, you know, so the exact equation um, is simple and by comparison because it's, it's basically three arithmetic operations that we have to somehow perform with this primitive IAS assembly. Um, and then get the calculation in for y. So here we have to, 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 to use the IAS to write a loop. Um, and it's further complicated because uh, we've actually got two variables that we need to update in the loop, but we only got, there is, there is like this MQ register as well. Um, I didn't use it in this example, so we might be able to use that. But we've effectively only got one register in the IAS computer, the accumulator. Um, so in this example solution, which is different from the solution manual solution, um, I solved that by using the, you know, getting the stuff into the accumulator and doing one of the calculations, storing the stuff back out, and then getting the other value in uh, and doing the calculation on it, basically, right? So for the supplementary um, problem, I mean, if you want to loop through the array, um, I mean, you will have to build a loop. Um, and um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about something. So, um, but, but um, so let's look at the loop here um, in this example. Um, So the basic idea is, uh, you know, first we need to initialize if we're just kind of directly compiling the pseudocode here. And, you know, the pseudocode, though, uh, was written kind of with the target instruction set that we have. So, of course, we wouldn't exactly, I wouldn't exactly write Python like this. I'd use higher level Python stuff. Uh, but anyway. Um, um, so I mean, the biggest thing being that uh, because we've only got 
uh, a conditional branch on um, on zero, basically, um, uh, or basically on non-zero. So we've got a conditional jump on non-zero. So that makes it easiest then to count down from n down to one. So uh, n, n minus one, n minus two, and so on in the loop. So we initialize a loop index variable to n, um, and you know y is going to be basically accumulating the sum. Although we're going to go backwards, so instead of summing from one to n, we're going to sum from n down to one. But you know we'll just be adding in you know n plus n minus one plus n minus two, and so on. Um, so anyway, you know, um, well, in, in this case, we don't have to initialize y because we're just assuming that um, um, we can def define uh, some memory locations to hold um, values that we're calculating on, right? Um, so we can just start with y is zero. Um, likewise, we can just start with um, uh, assuming that n is passed in or n is initialized when the program is loaded to the value that we want to uh, sum up the series for. Um, but um, but yeah, so we don't assume that I was initialized in, so I, but I guess you know I, I could have also just assumed that that was initialized the same place. But but anyway, so so we initialize we, we load. In into the accumulator, and then we store that back out. Um, I haven't bothered to um, change to actually put the the um, address in here like I should. So I'm, I'm I'm assuming that 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 this could be run through an assembler, basically an IS a, IS assembler. Which so one of the the um, jobs of an assembler like this is if we've got symbols associated with addresses. If we use the symbolic names, that those would get replaced by the corresponding address, right? So this would be loading from 1003, which is the address that we assigned to n. This would be storing uh, the value back out to 1001 um, to do the initialization and so on. Okay? So I mean, you know, again, this is all stuff that that I kind of assume that people should be familiar with. Uh, that this this idea of, of kind of how an assembly program works and what an assembler does, right? So, so assembler is a much lower construct than a compiler. So a compiler would take something like this, high level instructions, um, and then get the assembly, you know, get, get this kind of level. And then, then we could use our assembler um, to, to get it down to the actual machine code, you know, which, which would be, you know, kind of like this on disk though. So it, it would actually be the magnetic, patterns of ones and zeros um, in some electro electrical system, you know, the actual machine language. So to do um, the loop, uh, we want to test if i is greater than zero. So what I'm, what I'm doing is um, if as long as i is greater than zero, um, we're going to actually do the loop. Um, and if it's equal to zero, um, we're going to jump past the loop, right? So that's the way you implement loops at the assembly language level is um, you use jump or branch statements to go back to somewhere um, and you use conditional of those um, in order to test a condition in the loop uh, to figure when you're done, figure out when you're done doing the loop. Right? Now here, uh, we load in the current value of i, and we're going to jump. I mean, there's different ways we could have done this, but we're going to jump to the continuation of the loop if it's positive, because the the jump statement works that um, if the uh, value that you're testing, um, which is is um, Um, which I have to remember here, 
Um, let me catch up real quick. Um, Oh, right. So, um, um, sorry, kind of drawn blank there. So, so basically, this is testing the accumulator. So, that's why we have to make certain the accumulator is loaded. So, it's really testing the value in the accumulator in this case. Um, and that's common for branch statements. So, I don't know why I was having a bit of a brain, um, uh, brain uh, halt there. But um, um, so, since the value is positive, um, we're going to actually take the branch. So when this is zero, we're not going to take the branch and we'll hit this. So when it's zero, we do an absolute jump to the uh, first the, the, the first address of the, the first opcode of the exit instruction. Here, we're actually jumping to the second um, opcode of the, uh, of the line 2002. So I probably should have put the continuation label here, but uh, by going to 20 to 39, that means we want to jump to the second half of 2002, which is where the, the loop continues here. Right. Um, so yeah, so like I already said, so if, it, if it's not zero, we're going to go down here. If it is zero, that's how we exit. Um, and, and supposedly by this point, the value in Y should have been the um, calculated summation of the series that we did. And then what we're doing in here um, is we first perform the uh, add into Y. So, um, um, In order to use the accumulator, I, I first have to squirrel away the accumulator. So again, I'm not doing things as efficiently as possible in this example, but I, I need to use the accumulator to do this calculation for y, y equals y plus i, right? Um, I sent you a question on the chat whenever you can get to it. Okay. So um, yeah, the MQ has to do with um, multiplication instructions that overflow the 12 bits, I believe. I'd uh, um, refresh my memory maybe. Um, but um, when, um, so anyway, you know, we, we first store the, uh, so the, the accumulator is expected to have the current value of i in here, but we want to use it to make the calculation for y. So we first store that back away to memory. Um, but um, I, I guess, um, um, you know, but, but we are assuming that the accumulator still has the value of i um, in there. So we just simply add y to that. So, so this adds the, the, the value from memory for, for where y is being kept. Um, and then we store that back out to Y. So the, 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 the effect of that for the 2003 um, is to add I plus Y, which just put in the accumulator, and then to, to put that back out into Y. Effectively doing this step here. Um, and then to uh, decrement the I variable, we load I back in because we clobbered the, the, the value in the accumulator by doing uh, calculating the Y here. So we have to get the current value of I back into the accumulator um, so that we can subtract one from it um, and store it back in there. And then we do an, an absolute back, jump back to the top of the loop, which will then do the, the thing that we already talked about, which will test whether we're done or not um, and, and do one more iteration. Um, all right, so, so that's the basic kind of thing that you need to um, um, have some familiarity with. So, um, so the MQ has to do with um, Uh, multiplication, I believe. I'm gonna have to go back and, and uh, uh, reread the description of it. 
if it did describe it, I'm sure they probably did a little bit, didn't they? Um, Uh, we're going to talk more about this when we talk about uh, the arithmetic logic unit and uh, how you perform, how you implement multiplication at the hardware level. So, the, the, I mean, the basic problem is, is that, um, right, if, if you're multiplying two 40-bit numbers, so, so, you know, we have 40 bits, so uh, when we're operating on numbers, um, you know, like, um, um, oh, sorry, when we're operating on numbers, um, like um, we were doing here, we're assuming that that all these addresses are all 40-bit long. So we're actually representing all these as a signed 40-bit integer for all these things. But the problem is, is that, um, right, if, if you multiply two 40-bit numbers, I mean, both of these could be really big, so the result wouldn't fit into 40 bits anymore, right? So when you do that, apparently the IAS machine uh, would um, read the description again. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, in theory, if, 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 and we'll talk more about this again. This is like chapter uh, unit 12 or so um, in the course here. So um, you always have this problem that um, um, the, the, your multiplication is gonna double the size of the number of bits. So it will put the lower order bits when you do a multiply into the AC and uh, yeah, we sit the, the other way around. So um, the most significant bits, the higher order bits in the accumulator and then the least significant bits in the NQ. So, um, Normally, what that meant is, you know, if you were using uh, modest sized integers, you could just use the AC result, right? But you, you might have to check. Um, so if, if your numbers got too big, um, the result would be too big to fit in 40 bits anymore. Um, and uh, you'd have to do something special, basically. Um, to, uh, to handle the result at that point. All right, um, then one final thing. So, um, yeah, so I did add, add a supplementary um, assignment. So to take another crack at doing the IAS, um, uh, writing an IAS program. So we have to do a loop similar to that. Um, so if you haven't found it yet, uh, one way to find it is down here. If you go to, you know, back to unit one um, and look for the thing. I didn't, I didn't make a PDF. Um, so um, yeah, I thought the instructions were on here. Um, um, hmm. Okay, well, I'll check that. Um, I guess you might have to go to the announcement um, about it. I must have forgotten to save that when I when I put that there. I meant to have this copied down uh, on the um, supplemental on the instructions there. There we go. So um, if you have these values and um, then the, the, the last memory address is going to be the number of um, now you see, I mean, you know, you can use that for your, your loop counter, your, you know, how many times you have to loop through here. So the biggest challenge is now that I'm thinking about it, um, I mean, you do have to be able to load um, um, from these different memory addresses. So, you know, I have to load from 1000 and then 1001 add that into your sum, running sum, then from 1002 to add that into your sum, right? So, um,
So um, you're most likely um, need to use address modify to do these. So what you'll need to do is manipulate the address. So you'll have to start at address 1000. Um, and load that, but, um, um, and then you'll have to add one to that in your loop and then store the, so, so you have to have a separate one that has the actual memory address, like 1000, uh, just as a, like a separate variable. Um, and then you can add one to that. And then what you wanna do is like store this back to uh, the, the appropriate place where you're trying to do the load. That makes sense, right? So somewhere if uh, in, in memory, you've got a load and you're saying load um, the value from memory uh, X. And, and initially when the program is created, uh, um, the address portion of that will be, for example, you can assume that it starts off at the, the first address, 1000 of the array, right? And somewhere you need to add, take 1,000, add one to it, have 1,001. Uh, use this to store the um, result. Uh, so you'll have like 1,001 in the accumulator at that point after you add, um, you know, 1,000 plus the next value, right? Um, um, and then you'll want to store that 1001 back into the location uh, where um, your load is in order to load the, the, the value from the array, right? Does that make sense? So that, that's the only kind of instruction that you have in IAS for doing something like that uh, for, for, for processing basically what are what are coming out to be pointers or uh, relative um, addresses here, this, this, uh, uh, this address modify instruction. Um, yeah, so, Let's, uh, any, I, I think that's, I'd like to wrap up kind of the assignment one. Um, any other questions about assignment one? So we should get to talking about assignment two here. Um, my usual thing for these sessions is to go like maybe about 40 minutes and take a break, 40 or 50 minutes. Um, so yeah, I mean, I usually do like to, you know, if we start at 6.20 to take a break about seven for 10 minutes, five minutes or 10 minutes, uh, and then go till, you know, 7.55, take another break or something like that. So, um, so yeah, let, let's take a five minute break um, and then we'll talk about assignment two uh, and also about uh, the uh, quiz two questions here. So we'll come back at 8.05 then. All right. Okay, um, let's go get started again. If everybody's ready. Uh, um, so, see that I do need to talk about uh, the quiz, uh, the, the, the fill in the blank questions. The fill in the blank questions were about uh, using Amdill's Law and Little's Law from chapter two. So I thought I'd talk about uh, that stuff first a little bit. Um, I'm going to jump back to the quiz questions here. So let's see. Um, so Amdel's Law, um, I mean, these are really good general use, useful things for making back of the envelope calculations in I mean, in computer science in general, but, uh, but especially kind of in this area of uh, machine architecture and, and, and uh, uh, 
other kinds of related around this level of, um, of, of computer usage. Okay. So anyway, um, Hermel's law um, gives a relationship of the amount of speed up that you can get um, when you parallelize something, okay? And it doesn't have to be just like programs, right? So um, uh, whenever you're doing something, um, and we'll take some examples to, 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 I mean, there was an example in the quiz about this where you had to apply Amdahl's law. Um, but, um, you know, so, so um, we'll be applying this in a couple of different uh, places, uh, especially for like, um, um, trying to calculate the speed up when we're using like pipelines for the CPU, uh, when we get down to those kinds of materials, things like that. All right. So speed up is just the, um, the, 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 the ratio of the time to execute a program on a single processor versus the time to execute. So the, the, to be more general here, and, and probably it would have been better in the, in the textbook if, if it had been as general as possible. So the speed up is just the time to execute some task versus the time to execute it after you make an improvement, right? Or after you do something to make it faster, right? So, um, um, so, you know, if, if, if it used to take 10 minutes to execute something and now it takes five minutes, you know, we, we optimize the code or, or we parallelized a bit of it or something, right? We had a speed up of 10 over five, so it's twice as fast. Right, so speed up is just a measure of, uh, of this ratio. You know, it's, it's how much faster it is now that you've improved um, something you know, to, to make it faster. Right. So, um, so in my notes, um, I, I kind of um, um, uh, break it down here. Um, so let me just describe this. Um, and, and Amel's law is really easy to kind of uh, uh, figure out yourself from first principles if you know what's going on, right? So, and that's kind of what I'm doing uh, in my lecture notes that I uh, had here. So, um, um, so define a couple of terms. Uh, so, so if T is the total execution time of a program, um, So, you know, if, if that's the total execution time uh, when it's running without any improvements, so when it's running uh, in, you know, serially. Um, and then, uh, well, so, so we'll define these other things. So we'll define F to be the fraction of time that can be, that we can parallelize or the, the fraction that we can improve in some way that we can speed up. So, so normally when we're working on something, some portions can't be improved. Um, so, so they're gonna remain um, executing, uh, needing the same amount of time to complete that portion of the task. Whereas some other, some other portion, some other fraction of the task can be improved. So, so when we're talking about parallelizing um, some process, you know, so, so maybe, uh, we can parallelize 90% of the task, but there's 10% that's inherently serial that we can't parallelize, right? Um, uh, for the, the question for the quiz that you had to apply Amdo's law that I'm thinking of here, uh, we might have 66% uh, of, of instructions in the instruction set uh, might uh, be other types of instructions uh, where 33% are a particular type, uh, multiply. I can't remember what the question was. Um, you know, so 33% so is a large percentage. So if we, if we could improve the speed of that 33%, uh, we can speed up uh, our calculations a bit. So. Um, So I'm going to switch over here to back over to my uh, back camera here. So, so some first principles. So, so, so T is, is the total time um, 
to run the tasks. So let, let's just make it concrete. So again, let, let's say that you know we've got a task that takes 10 minutes to run. All right. Um, and let, let's say that we can parallelize, you know, 50% um, of this task, all right? So, so the fraction that we can parallelize is 50% or you know, 0.5 by ratio. So that implies, right, that, that implies that, that uh, five minutes um, is um, inherently serial, um, or we're not improving whatever we're doing here. So half of it, we, we can't improve. But the other half, uh, we're going to do something to it to reduce that time. All right. So um, kind of as I said in my notes, the, 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 I mean, this is basically the, the, the time. So if, if F is the fraction that we can um, parallelize uh, 1 minus F, you know, we could have assigned um, a different variable to that, maybe s, but but the, the the part that's serial is just the one minus that, uh, which is still zero point five in this example. But you know, if we can parallelize ninety five percent, that leaves just five percent or point zero five in that case, right? Um, So uh, the, the five minutes that I uh, that I got here. Um, so maybe let me, pick, let me pick something different so that we don't let me not confuse it. Let's say the fraction that we can parallelize is um, um, since we're using ten here, we'll, we'll say um, is eighty percent or 0.8. Right. So if we have that, and then of course the serial portion, then the, the part that remains unparallelizable or, or that we can't improve is, is 20 or 0.2, right? So if we do that, the, 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 the part of, the, 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 if, if our total time is 10 minutes, that implies that um, um, two tenths of that or 20% or two minutes, um, um, can't be improved, so it's, it's still running in serial um, or, or uh, the non-improved part. But we've got uh, the other uh, eight minutes, so that's t times f, um, which can be potentially improved, right? So we could bring that time down by by in, in improving the performance of that. So the total time. Um, um, the, the total time is is t before we try to do any improvements, um, and the total time um, after we break it apart into the serial and the parallel part is just just the addition of that, right? So if we make no improvement, it would still be the same. We would have no speed up. So just t times one minus f plus t times the uh, f portion, right? Um, and then you know if you factor out the t's, so you get you get t times. Um, oh, and and um, so then uh, to get the final Andel's law, you know we should note that um, um, this uh, fraction of time um, that, that we can improve, we're going to improve it. Like like if we can parallelize it, say if we, if it's if it's perfectly parallelizable. Um, and uh, we can have four processors or, or four workers uh, to work on it all in parallel. That, uh, if it's perfectly parallelizable, um, uh, we'll divide exactly by the number of workers in. So, so yeah, again, if n was four, that means that instead of taking eight, eight minutes, we would divide it equally between all four of the workers and it would take two minutes, you know, eight divided by four or, or two minutes. Um, so, um, so again, yeah, th then you can easily derive the final form of, um, Andel's law because you can factor out the T's and you get the one, um, over one minus F plus F over N, which is the form that was given in the textbook. All right. Um, so, 
that allows us then to do all kinds of things and not just with you know calculating uh, the speed up if we're parallelizing some tasks so but yeah somebody's a um, good question somebody's asking about then what is the maximum speed up the asymptotic limit so that's basically um, um, if the task is perfectly parallelizable so so uh, in my notes here we give an example so if the fraction that's parallelizable is is 0.95 um, that means that that five percent is inherently unparallelizable but the fraction that we can parallelize it, it, again you know nothing is ever perfectly we, we can't speed it up so that it takes zero time at all so you can you can never get uh, a perfect speed up but in theory uh, if, if that's highly parallelizable if i can throw billions and billions of workers at it um, i can effectively reduce that time to zero um, so, so, so the speed up, the maximum speed up, if, if you could get that theoretically perfectly um, um, parallelization or perfect, perfect improvement where you're improving that part down to zero. Uh, and I guess you kind of can get that because sometimes you can find, um, sometimes you can find, um, um, enhancements that completely remove the needs for some calculations while still uh, doing the, 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 the actual full work that you need to do, right? So, but, but anyway, um, so that's what we, what we mean by um, the, the, the maximum theoretical um, uh, speed up. So uh, it's gonna be constrained by how much of the task uh, you're able to put through some improvement process um, and then also in practice, uh, is constrained by, you know, you can't throw infinite amount of, of resources to that and actually get the time down to zero. So there's, there's, um, there's going to be some portion of it uh, uh, that, that you can't reduce completely um, when you um, improve um, uh, some portion of the task, right? But if, if you can improve it uh, completely, then that would go away. Um, so for, for example, for uh, uh, um, where we have 95% of the task uh, that can be improved or can be parallelized, at least 5% that can't be. So in theory, we're gonna reach a maximum upper limit of, of a 20 times speed up. So we can never get more than 20 times speed up uh, unless we can do something with that remaining 5%, improve its speed as well a bit, right? So, um, so that's the basics of, of Amdahl's law, right? Um, so in theory, so that implies, for example, in theory that the, the maximum speed up is gonna be 100 um, if we can parallelize the, the fraction uh, that we can improve is 99% of the code or 99% of the task, uh, we can do something to improve. That, that, still, leaves, that still leaves 1%. Right, so, so we'll, we'll reach an asymptotic limit as we throw more and more workers or more and more processors at it um, of a hundred um, if we get bigger and bigger. So, um, all right. So for example, the, there was like three questions in the, uh, the, the short answer, fill in the blank ones. Um, were about uh, where you really had to apply Amdahl's law. Um, so, for example, yeah, the first one was the one I was trying to think of. So, this, it's um, um, it, it can be applied more than just to like um, 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 figuring out uh, speed up if you're parallelizing or threading a program or something like that. So if we have a system where a third of the operations are floating point operations, that means that, that um, um, I'm gonna switch back to my dot camera. So, so if, if, if one third are floating point operations, uh, so 0.33, uh, that, that's actually F in this problem we're, we're applying Amdahl's law. That means that, that the other uh, two thirds or 0.66 um, are, are operations that we're not going to do anything about. Um, so, so we're just 
trying to improve the performance of the system by concentrating on improving the, the speed up of the floating point operations, um, uh, which make up one third of the total operations on the system here, right? So, so if we can speed those up, uh, uh, we'll speed up the system. So, Uh, if, if we increase the execution speed of the floating point operations by a factor of 100, uh, I mean, that's basically your in here. So, so that's um, 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 how much faster that portion will, will, will go, right? So, so we've got our basic of 1 over 0.66 plus 0.33 over 100, right? Which is um, 1 over um, 0.69. Right, so that gives you um, what the answer was supposed to be 1.49, uh, basically. So, I write 1.48 and then it got wrong. I uh, know I went, went back and gave everybody who had 1.48 or 1.50 the point, so check again. Uh, if, if you still haven't seen it, um, so it graded, you know, of course, the auto grader, you had to get exactly 1.49, but I've, I've gone through most of them. So, um, but yeah, try and try and give me, you know, two, at least two decimal places for questions like this. Um, So what's the asymptotic limit? Uh, 0.98. So that's kind of directly from the lecture notes. Um, so that's just going to be one over the uh, 0 0.02 plus 0 0.98 over the infinity. So that gets you the one over 0 0.02. Um, oh, I, I I just read the. I forgot. Uh, yeah, you can see the uh, um, questionnaire. I kind of have to. Switch back and forth between these. Uh, what's the maximum? So one of the questions was, what's the maximum speed up for a system where you can paralyze 0.98, you know, 98 percent of the tasks? So um, um, that's just going to be one over 0 0.02, um, which is um, 50. And then another one was um, if we want to achieve a speed up of um, <coughs> um, 10 times. Um, so, so here we have to reverse the uh, equation a bit. So, so we want to get a speed up of 10 times um, on a system where the fraction of the task is paralyzable is, is 0.95. So that's 10 equals 1 over 0 0.05 plus. Uh, 0.95 over n. So here we're, we need to find um, uh, n to achieve that, that speed up of 10 here, right? So, you know, you have to rearrange a bit. So multiply this, divide by that. So we get uh, uh, um, 0 0.05 plus 0.95 equals uh, 0.95 over n equals 1 tenth. Um, um, and we can subtract 0 0.05, so we get 0.95 n equals, uh, this is one tenth of 0.1 equals 0 0.05. And so we're going to end up with n equals uh, 0.95 over 0 0.05, which should give us an answer of um, 19. All right. And we can double check our work on that, right? So if, if we plug that back in, um, so if, if we plug back in uh, one over uh, 0 0.05 plus, uh, nine, plus 0 0.95 over 19 um, and do the calculation, you know, we should get the, the speed up of, of 10 there in that case. So I'm just checking it out on my calculator on my own here, so. Always good to check your work, though. You know, um, once you come up with the answer, go back. Um, especially if you're doing something in the reverse. Uh, yeah, so that gives you your speed up of ten uh, in that case. Um, Uh, 
And then uh, Little's Law. Um, this is actually um, a kind of a pretty, pretty simple um, relationship, but it comes from a very deep sort of um, um, concept or, or deep sort of uh, thinking here. Um, I mean, it has to do with queuing theory, which is really important to computer science. Um, um, it is kind of important to understand that we're talking about steady state conditions here, right? So in general, you know, the, the things like the arrival rates um, um, aren't changing. So, so, so there's some kind of a, a, a queuing system happening here um, and kind of the, the rate of arrival of new of, of work to be done or, or new things to be processed in the queuing system um, um, is steady over, uh, over the time period of study, basically. So, Um, so, um, I mean, you know, again, this is, this is what, well, um, I think we'll be using this, um, um, for lots of other envelope kinds of calculations, um, in different aspects. So it can apply generally to, to lots of different, uh, things. So anytime you have a system, where you know you've got um, uh, one or more workers or servers or, or or things that are doing work, and then you've you've got um, um, uh, work coming in continually, and and the work can be queued up in different ways, right? It doesn't really matter for Little's law, but you know you could have like one server uh, in one queue. Um, you could have multiple servers and, and each server has their own kind of separate queue. I could have multiple servers, workers, and, and then one queue, one common queue feeding into the multiple workers and, and different different sorts of setups and things there. So most of that doesn't matter uh, just if we're considering this um, the system um, and, and it's generally staying at a steady state. Uh, the, the three quantities on this are the um, uh, the, the uh, lambda. That's just a Greek letter um, uh, often used um, to uh, represent rates of things. So, um, so the, the, that, that's going to that has to be a, a measure of units of work per some time unit. So units of work over time. Um, and the W is just the average wait time and length is just the average number of items waiting in the queue. And okay? so the textbook gives, uh, tries to give a, um, um, an intuitive way to understand kind of why this relationship holds, right? So the basic idea is that, uh, you know, if, if the average, again, this is a steady state. So if the average, um, number of items in the queue is five, uh, that means there's gonna be five, you know, four people in front of you when you arrive. And then once you work up to the front of the queue and you're getting serviced, um, there's gonna be five people behind you, right? So that implies that basically in the time that I go from being at the back of the queue to the, the front of the queue, that's my wait time. Right. And again, a steady, steady state system, my wait time is going to be average, usually. You know, so, so most people will experience about that same average wait time. So in the time that I'm waiting, um, that implies that five people must have arrived you know, if the average length is L, because um, uh, so, so that means that, 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 um, 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 that times the wait time. Um, has to relate to the average length of the queue, right? Uh, under these kinds of steady state conditions. Um, So anyway, and the, the, the three quiz questions um, uh, that were due for today, um, all of them were kind of directly applying this. 
uh, as long as you just knew the quantities. I think the biggest thing that, that uh, for one, one or two of the questions was making certain that you convert the units correctly. So, you know, if, if we have wait times in minutes, but arrival times in hours, you have to make certain you're using common units, things like that. So um, let's look at those. So um, if we have five people arrive at the coffee, coffee shop each minute, so, so that's um, um, a lambda, uh, that's a rate here, five per minute. Um, um, and they each have to wait for three minutes to be served. So that, that's the, the average wait time, um, three minutes. So how long is the line on average at the, the coffee shop during rush hour, right? That's just directly um, applying L equals lambda W. Given lambda W, three and five. Um, um, so that um, implies under steady state conditions that um, um, normally there's 15 people uh, in the queue. Um, all right. Uh, so yeah, so 15 will be your average length of the, the queue there. Um, the, the next one, if the average wait at the bank is 15 minutes, or that was kind of meant to be a hit, a quarter of an hour. Um, so again, that's W, um, 15 minutes. Uh, and, and Lambda is 10 arrived per hour. Right, so converting the, the first one to, if we want to use a common unit, say hours, uh, we can call that uh, um, that the average wait time is a quarter of an hour, so put two five um, hours. So what's the average length of the line in the bank? So it's just 10 times uh, 0.25 or, or 2.5. Uh, we expect that the average length of the line is two and a half customers. Um, okay, so this one is the only one where you had to kind of apply it in reverse a bit. Um, so um, if we're required to make sure that the wait time is more, no more than five minutes, so, so W is five minutes in this case. Um, and if the customers are arriving at 30 customers per hour, so again, they need to be careful about um, um, the, uh, the units here. So we've, we've got 30 customers per hour. Um, so, you know, uh, we could just um, say that our wait time is, is 5 60th of an hour or, or 1 12th of an hour, for example. Um, so at what length of of the queue, should we begin adding more servers to keep service time below five minutes? I mean, so again, um, uh, if, uh, if you multiply those two, you'll get the the average length of the queue implied by you know a five minute or one twelfth of an hour wait time um, with thirty customers per hour. Um, that gives you two point five. So it's a, so the length of the queue is two point five, right? So basically what's being asked here, so if you work it out, is, is that um, um, you want to speed up the processing, so you want to make the system not be steady state anymore, but, uh, but you, need, you want to speed up the process by adding more servers if the line begins to get more than about two and a half people on average on it at, at, uh, uh, at any given time period that you measure. Um, uh, at any instant in time, I should say. It's not really over a time period, but at an instant in time. And if you think about that, you know, that should make sense. So, for example, um, um, if you plug in, um, if you hold, let's say, for example, the arrival rate is constant, 30 customers per hour, 
But if you say, okay, what, what, what does that imply for um, if I have an average of three people in the line instead of two and a half people uh, in line? Um, so in that case, you know, you'd have to kind of work it uh, backwards, but um, um, but in that case, the, 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 the equation that I gave there was that L was three. So, so if L was three, if, if, I, if, I, if I'm slipping a bit and my um, uh, average length of the line has come to three people and I've got uh, 30 arriving per hour, um, what's that imply about the wait time, right? Um, and implies that the wait time is now one tenth or six minutes, right? So, so if my, my queue is getting too big. And again, if the queue is bigger, um, uh, all things being equal, uh, that means people have to wait longer before they get serviced, right? So once my queue starts slipping a bigger than 2.5, the wait times are gonna start getting bigger and bigger. So at that point, uh, hopefully, you know, um, if, if we want to keep the wait times five minutes, we want to add another barista on there um, so that they can uh, increase the rate of um, 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 service with people and keep that line length uh, to two or three people, two and a half at any given instant. Um, Okay, so those were the kind of the questions on the Andal's Law and Little's Law. Um, so let's. Um, Let's, let's move real quickly, probably uh, go ahead and look at then the assignment two, um, which has some questions on Andal and Lowe's Law and some other things. So see if there's any questions about uh, that that's due on Friday then. Um, So a couple of questions you have to apply, you know, those two things again. Um, so, you know, I think you have to apply Little's Law for two. Um, um, and for five and, and then four is some more about Andal's Law. Um, uh, the first question has to do with calculating some um, um, measures using these benchmark results again. Okay. So that all comes from um, the, um, the uh, second, I lost my uh, table of contents here. I'll restart that in a second. Um, So, um, oh, yeah, so in chapter two, you know, um, there's some other things in there that you'll need for the first question. So you'll have to apply the uh, expressions in order to figure out the cycles per instruction. Um, the, the, Processor time needed, and so on, right? So, um, this, this is a common or this is a good thing to understand in general about how real computers work, right? So, uh, and we'll get more into this, but um, I mean, calculating how many instructions per second a computer can execute um, is, is not as straightforward as you might. Um, assume uh, or, or think it is at, at first glance, right? So um, 
you know, so, so a, na a naive person who doesn't know too much computers, only the basics might, you know, think, well, if you just know the clock speed, like in megahertz, so, so like 200 megahertz means what? It means that we have 200 cycles per second. So that, that's just the clock cycles. Um, um, so, so how many clock cycles happen? So the, the, the thing to realize, right, is that not all instructions execute in a constant number of cycles on a computing system, okay? So for, um, as we'll talk about in this class, for um, um, some architectures, they, they try and keep the number of cycles for instructions to be more constant or about as equal as possible and try to keep it down to, to keep, to have simple instructions so that every instruction takes one cycle or, or two cycles at most or something like that, right? That, that's your basic um, uh, reduced instructions at the computer, which I, I believe is first mentioned in this chapter or somewhere, I think. No. Um, whereas, you know, uh, more typical complex instructions at computers um, will have, you know, some simple instructions that might just take one clock cycle, but can have some very complex instructions like four, six, eight cycles. Um, I don't know what, what kind of the the biggest upper limit is on, on that kind of thing, but uh, you, can get, you can get some really kind of complex, high level ideas being pushed down into a single instruction to do things like a whole array calculation or something like that, which could take many, many cycles. So anyway, that, that all complicates this. So if you just want a simple answer, so how many millions of instructions, so you can easily answer, so how many, many cycles per second or millions of cycles per second, clock cycles, does the uh, system perform? But the, the reason why you know the 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 clock rate of the CPU isn't so um, useful information uh, is just because of, of exactly because of this issue, right? So knowing that you know a typical a typical what clock rate nowadays is uh, two gigahertz, three gigahertz, four gigahertz is about the upper limit for most things right now. So, so a gigahertz is what? It's a, it's a thousand megahertz, right? So Four billion instructions per second or two or cycles per second. Two to four billion cycles per second is, is, is your two to four gigahertz, right? Um, but because there can be a lot of variation in the number of cycles you need to um, execute an instruction, um, knowing the clock speed doesn't necessarily tell you the performance that you can expect from the computer, um, which is why MIPS can be a, a more useful um, measure. So, and there's a corresponding one, which I didn't have a question about, but the uh, textbook probably, I think talks about also megaflops so you can talk about millions of floating point operations per second, which is pretty important in scientific computing, that uh, most scientific computations need to use floating point operations. So knowing your flops and, and megaflops and gigaflops is pretty important uh, for rating the performance of um, uh, supercomputers and things like that. Um, So anyway, um, we can though find an um, uh, uh, expression for, for MIPS and then also expressions for the total um, execution time on, on each machine, or we can calculate those from information given, you know, like, like in prompts like this. Um, so the, I mean, you know, we know what the cycles per instruction is for different types. So again, it's, it's usually going to be something like this: um, different in, uh, instruction categories. So categories in, of instructions will typically have similar, if not the same, cycles per instruction uh, requirements. Right? But then other categories will have more or less cycles per instruction needed. Um, So if you want to know what the effective cycles per instruction is, um, 
we don't want to take a simple average because that's all that, that's a little bit too simple. So I mean, you know, I could just take a simple average, you know, um, which is 2.5 here, right? Um, but um, the problem is, is that we typically, and, and that's what this benchmark is, is showing here, typically some categories of instructions or some types of instructions are going to be much more um, needed and they're going to be used much more than others, right? So what we really want is an, as a weighted average, right, in order to get the effective um, cycles per instruction. So if we have a weighted average, that will tell us um, in general, uh, regardless of what the instruction type is, typically, because then, and then if you have the effective cycles per instruction, then you can know that if I have this many instructions, if I just multiply that by the effective CPI, that tells you what the actual um, um, execution time is. Right? Because execution time, like, like to execute uh, a load instruction, like on this first one, it actually, you know, it doesn't take six cycles, it takes 12 cycles. And we know each cycle takes one um, 200 millionth of a second because we have 200 million. So, so, so this is the, our, our, for, for our textbook, this is um, um, called F, the, the, the frequency. Uh, and if you do one over that, that that's, that's labeled as tau. That, that's the actual time for a single cycle. So, so if you know the frequency of the, 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 the clock cycle, um, then the, the, the um, one over that, the reciprocal of that um, tells you the time for a single instruction, um, to, for, sorry, for a single cycle to execute. That's, that's not a single instruction, but, but yeah, the time for a single clock cycle um, to be performed. So it's gonna be one over 200 million in this case. Um, and that comes out to, um, Five millionths of a second, um, or no, point five millionths of a second. Um, anyway, no, that's not quite right because this is two hundred, so uh, point five billionths of a second. So. Um, all right, so the. Um, you know, so for example, this is this is the this is really just a weighted average. If you know what this is, uh, you know we we we're multiplying um, the cycles per instruction times the instruction count for each instruction. So that gives the weighting. Right? So by multiplying by the, the 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 relative number of instructions of that type. Uh, again, this is not six, but six million here, and four million, two million, but um, and then divide by the total instruction count. So the, the, the total instruction count is the sum of all of these. So it's 18 million for machine A uh, in this benchmark. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, if you have the effective, so, so you can pretty easily calculate the, the total time. Um, um, I mean, you should, should make certain that you understand what we're doing. So you know that there's, if there's 6 million of this type of instruction that will run, and you know that each of those instructions takes one cycle, and you know that each cycle takes one over 200 uh, um, million um, seconds. So one 200 million of a second to execute. I mean, if you do the calculation right, that tells you exactly how much time it took to run those 6 million instructions. And this one's going to be twice as long because you know there's six million of them as well, but they take two cycles, so they take uh, two um, two hundred millions of a second, right? So from first principles, from that, from 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 what I'm just describing, if you worked out the calculations correctly, you can figure out exactly how much time it takes for this program to run, given the clock speed, the number of instructions that execute. That take one cycle per instruction, the number of instructions two cycles per instruction, and so on. Um, 
And then MIPS is, you know, uh, again, so we're not really interested in how many cycles total. I mean, how many cycles total run is directly related to the total time that we need it, right? But the, uh, the amount of useful work is really going to be in terms of the number of an actual instructions that we got uh, finished, not the number of cycles that we needed, right? So to, to get the, the MIPS, we, we really need to know the total time, and, and we want to divide the, the total instructions, not cycles, but instructions by our total time. I mean, that's really what MIPS is, millions of instructions per day, right? So, so yeah, I mean, if you, if you know your total time, if you just divide your instructions, so if, if, if you want million, if, if you just want a um, uh, number of instructions per second, not millions of instructions per second, you can just divide the number of instructions divided by the total time, right? If you want millions of instructions per second, it's the total number, uh, it's the total millions of instructions. So the total number of instructions divided by a million gives you the number of millions of instructions that we executed. Then you divide that by your total time, minutes, millions of instructions. Um, all right, I guess the only other one then is um, uh, question three. I think you have all the information, it's, it's related to performance, uh, so related to some of the concepts in chapter two. All right, so um, any questions? Did I miss anybody's questions? This is a good time for a break here, unless somebody wants to ask about the second assignment or things. Um, all right, so let's take another five minute break. Um, although when I come back, again, we might not take too much longer now because um, I'm just gonna go over the chapter two notes, but um, um, I don't think I have too much more to add, so. All right, let's take five. Okay, um, let's get going again. If um, everybody's ready again here. Um, like I said, I, th I think kind of we've covered most everything. You know, I went back, looked through here, see if there's any other stuff to add before we wrap up. Um, so I'll just say a few things. Um, so, at the start of our chapter two, um, we talked a little bit about how, uh, what, what computer architects are doing in order to try and speed up their processors, you know, speed up the, 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 the you know, the, the, the heart of the competing system, you know, to make them faster, right? Um, so, you know, besides relying on, uh, Increasing clock speeds and um, um, and, and you know that, that comes from basic properties of the fabrication techniques for chips, right? So um, I mean, uh, I don't remember if he talks about Moore's law um, at the beginning here on chapter, two, but. Um, Um, I mean, you know, part of the, the driving factor um, is that, that, that there's been kind of a, a bit of a free ride. Um, the, the, uh, yeah, he talks a little, little bit about it here, um, or, or I guess maybe that was in chapter one where he introduced some of the things about Moore's Law. Um, so because of the, the, the the chip manufacturing process on which CPUs are based, um, you know, about every two years or every 18 months, 
uh, we've been seeing that this this doubling uh, in performance. So they've been getting you know two times faster, two times smaller, two times less power needed uh, because of the improvements on the uh, you know basically making it uh, the components smaller and smaller using finer um, um, techniques for laying down the, the circuits uh, down on the integrated circuits right so i mean that that's been the big driver of performance boosts for for competing systems so i mean you just rely on the chip being you know two times faster you can use the same architecture the the, the same assembly language and, and things but the, your system will speed up um, as the chip um, manufacturing capacity improves right um, but um, we are beginning to reach some fundamental limits on Moore's law, right? So we're beginning to bump, bump up to actual physics um, that's going to make it increasingly tougher and tougher to actually keep you know, uh, developing processes that uh, make the um, uh, integrated circuit smaller and smaller and thus faster and faster and more energy efficient, right? So um, there's been an increasing um, reliance on other techniques to increase performance for computing systems in general and, and, and um, for computer architectures, you know, kind of the, the core topic of this course. Um, so, so, you know, it lists some of the most important ones. So, you know, this is becoming more and more important on um, modern processors as, you know, we reach Moore's law, right? So one of the big consequences that you might be most aware of is that up until 10 years ago or so, I mean, it was pretty rare to actually have a system with more than one CPU, right? And when they started appearing, you first started seeing systems where where there would be multiple cpus um but um they were um actual separate chips um you know so, so separate cpu chips um on um the motherboard of the competing system right uh, and then that's further evolved though so now it's not uncommon to have a, a single integrated chip with what are called cores which are effectively multiple CPUs, so multi-car systems. So that, that's talked a little bit about in this chapter as well. Um, so, you know, four cores, eight cores. Uh, I mean, eight cores has become pretty common now, uh, even in your standard, like, I mean, like your, your Snapdragon phones or, or your um, ARM processor phones are probably eight core nowadays, most of the most recent ones. And, and you know, that, trend is continuing so consumer level i mean servers are already using 16 32 core bigger kinds of things regularly um, and those things will continue down into um, consumer level uh, products so. um So, and, 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 you know, the reason for that is one consequence of Moore's law. So, I mean, that's uh, al allowing uh, more parallelism. So, you know, one reason why they went first from separate integrated circuits, so CPUs on separate integrated circuits, then to becoming cores on a single integrated circuit is uh, that increases performance by putting um, the things closer together. So that reduces communication time. So you can increase. Um, so so you, so you have to start writing programs to take advantage of having multiple CPUs or multi cores on a single integrated circuit, right? And you can kind of get them fast, the, the parallelism faster and faster if you can reduce the communication costs and communication speed between them and things like that. Right? Um, anyway, so the, there's. You know, some other techniques, um, like I said, are becoming more and more important. Um, so pipelining is essentially um, another type of parallelization. This has to do with um, um, 
clock cycles. Okay, so for a mod for a modern complex instruction set computer, uh, instructions take multiple clock cycles um, to execute. But you know, you would like if you could, you'd like to redesign things so that the instructions only took one clock cycle, right? So then, whatever clock speed you can drive your integrated circuit at, you can get one instruction per cycle, um, which would be the best that you can do. Um, so pipelining is a way to parallelize at the computer uh, architecture level, the integrated circuit chip level, um, parallelized instruction execution, right? So the basic idea is, is an assembly line. We'll talk a lot more about this later on. Um, assembly line concept. So instead of always just executing one instruction, so if, if one instruction takes five cycles, You'd have to do execute all five cycles to get that one instruction before you start executing the next instruction. So in the pipelining, uh, you might break your instruction into five cycles, and those five cycles might represent different steps um, in the execution of the instruction. So fetching the instruction from memory, decoding it, fetching the operands from memory, performing calculations, storing results, just as an example. Uh, and then you might parallelize it that, um, you know, so you might have multiple instructions uh, being worked on simultaneously. So you might fetch the first instruction, and then when it's done fetching, you might decode the first instruction, but in parallel, you fetch the second instruction, right? And you can do that because um, the logic for fetch uh, can maybe only do one at a time, but you can be using that logic for fetch at the same time the other logic elsewhere is being used to decode a different instruction. Right. So um, anyway, that, I mean, that kind of pipelining um, has become more important to increase the performance. So as we're hitting Moore's law, uh, we're having to do other things to uh, increase performance, you know, like trying to effectively reduce the instruction execution to one cycle, one instruction per cycle by trying to pipeline. Um, but uh, pipelines, one big problem with them is that whenever you hit a branch instruction, um, and again, we'll talk more about this later on, um, but whenever you hit a branch instruction, um, you don't know which, which instruction is going to be fetched after that point. So um, it's, it's hard to um, keep your pipeline full if you have lots of branch instructions going on. Um, so you just can't, I mean, you know, uh, you could just not fill your pipeline until you resolve that branch. That's, that's one thing, but, but then, you know, you don't have any parallelism going on until you resolve the branch and then start pipelining again. Um, so there's various things to try and resolve that, like to do branch prediction. So you might try and well, predict, okay, so maybe I'm going to take this branch. You know, so maybe I am going to do that jump and then, you know, start doing your pipelining as if you did that jump. And of course, you could be wrong doing that, in which case um, you'll have some work that uh, uh, is a bit wasted, right? Um, so there's other methods that we'll talk about in more detail later on. Um, so oh, just kind of an interesting side note. Um, some of you may or may not have heard of the uh, Spectre vulnerability, the Spectre bug, um, and the related um, 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 what was, um, but uh, anyway, so uh, this was this was kind of a really big deal in, in security, uh, computer security. Um, I mean, it's, as far as I know, it's still uh, a problem. Um, this had to do with uh, an exploit. Um, that people were able to basically use the, the speculative execution, which is um, um, related to this branch prediction that I was talking about, um, in order to see stuff that they weren't supposed to see. Um, so basically, you know, forcing speculative, speculative execution to happen uh, examining kind of the results of that and then being able to use that so that 
when the thing failed, like for example, like trying to calculate whether a password was correct or not. Um, and so you can enter an incorrect password, but you can kind of spy on the speculative execution as the, and, and, and infer some things about what the correct thing would have been. That's kind of the basic idea of that. So anyway, um, as far as I know, they're still trying to work to mitigate that. Um, so it was a big deal because in order to remove the vulnerability, you kind of had to turn off the branch prediction and speculative execution hit on performance on like servers and stuff. So. Um, So, yeah, so uh, I've kind of already mentioned these two. So, again, we're, we're talking about computer architecture in this course, um, and computer architects are very concerned about improving performance of computing systems, right? So, that's kind of the, the, the primary focus of, of building computers in order to, 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 to squeeze as much performance out of them as you can and to, to, to increase. Um, continually um, so they can do more. Um, so we talked about, you know, increase the hardware speed, um, which, you know, is a function of the integrated circuit chip processing and manufacturing process. Um, and all the stuff I've just been talking about um, is really kind of this, this um, third one here. So if you're hitting fundamental limits, um, then we can go back and try and, and do things to speed up our instruction executing themselves in various ways. So, uh, and then the other kind of main way that um, computer performance has been being uh, increased is by increasing the performance of the memory um, access system. Okay, so we're going to be talking more, a lot more about this in next week, next unit, next couple of units. Um, so, memory. Um, is a particular bottleneck in computing systems currently because memory technology, to, uh, the, the, you know, so the technology to uh, store and retrieve data from memory um, typically runs much slower than the um, speed of the chip, uh, of the CPU, um, uh, the, the processor. So because of that bottleneck, uh, we have to do lots of different things in order to try and increase memory performance, right? So we can increase the, the size and speed. So base, the basic thing that we use is caching technologies. So we use different kinds of memory technologies that have different performance characteristics um, to try and reduce the memory bottleneck. So we'll talk more about that um, in the next unit. Um, So, um, oh yeah, so he was talking in chapter two about um, um, more law some more. So this is kind of an important uh, figure uh, to understand. So, you know, this is kind of um, uh, stuff I've already talked about here, but, uh, but this is really just a direct um, um, graphing of Moore's law relationship. So no matter kind of what you're measuring, uh, in terms of power uh, or the number of cores, well, not that, but power or uh, the clock cycle speed um, is kind of an easy one to understand. So, so you'll notice that it's turning like this. And, and so this might look like it's just turning linearly, but this is a, um, a, an exponential scale here. So again, effectively, you know, so it's, it's not um, uh, doubling, it, it's, it's not um, increasing linearly, but it's like doubling over two year periods, the, the frequency. But you'll notice though, um, uh, all these things, uh, we start hitting um, definite uh, flattenings of these curves. Um, you know, so looking at um, frequency, so, so clock cycle speed, um, um, power consumption, right? And, and, and that's 
right when you saw the uh, jump starting to happen on uh, going from single cores to multiple cores, right? So, so, so once that starts flattening, uh, other ways have to um, be done in order to increase performance, so including uh, adding uh, more cores to computing systems. Um, so besides, you know, CPUs with multiple cores, um, so pretty soon, I mean, you know, the, the technologies are coming along um, that we're going to see uh, really huge numbers of cores, it looks like coming on a uh, general purpose core. We already have things like that. So really, if you if you know what the uh, GPU computing is, well, I mean, most people um, that are somewhat familiar with uh, computing systems know a GPU as a graphical processing unit, right? So uh, this, this is an example of a coprocessor, right? So in, in a typical computing, computing system nowadays, um, you often have other processors besides your main CPU, central processing unit, uh, in the system, right? So the central processing unit um, is a processor for doing general calculations, but you know you might have. I mean, nowadays there's often like a CPUs on your uh, hard drives that are doing um, I/O kinds of tasks, or maybe a direct mem direct um, memory access uh, transfer kinds of tasks. Um, You'll have small CPUs on your um, on your network cards that are uh, performing some portions of the uh, TCP/IP stack functions um, for the system um, down at like the Ethernet level and things like that. Um, you'll have um, CPUs um, on your uh, peripheral bus systems and things like that. Right. So GPUs are another one, probably one of the easier ones to understand. Um, so their original purpose was a uh, processing unit that was specifically designed to render graphics. So, so a graphical processing unit um, for driving a display. So typically for like gaming, things like that, right? So, um, and it turns out though that um, the way you build really high performance graphical processing units is that it's a highly parallelizable because every pixel on a display can often be calculated um, in parallel with every other pixel. So if you have like one core per pixel, um, you can calculate the updates for all the pixels on a, a graphical display um, in parallel. And you know, I'm I'm simplifying quite a bit, but but that's kind of at the heart of what a GPU does, right? And it turns out though that um, you know those the 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 processors in the GPU are relatively simple. There's lots of them. There's thousands of them in a typical GPU um, in order to try and you know get up to that theoretical limit of, of having one per each pixel, um, but um, Um, anyway, but but they are a lot simpler, so so they're really kind of like uh, uh, reduced instruction set kinds of computers, the the processors in a GPU, right? But um, those, I mean, have turned out to be very useful not just for um, driving graphics, but for driving um, scientific computing in general. So lots of scientific computing problems. Um, can be parallelized in the same way because lots of scientific computing problems can be reduced down to matrix multiplication uh, uh, systems of equations and, and systems of matrix manipulation, basically. And um, kind of in the same way, uh, you can parallelize the operations of the matrices um, using lots and lots of simple processors. So a lot of modern machine learning um, um, and um, uh, deep learning and things like that that you may have heard of are driven by um, 
using uh, GPUs, right? In fact, this has become so useful that people are now designing um, general purpose GPUs. So they're not really graphical anymore. So general purpose, uh, highly parallel processors. Um, so the, the Tensor processor um, is being driven by Google, I believe, for, as an example of that, or basically for scientific computing. Um, all right, so yeah, so yeah, we pretty much we we more than adequately covered Andal's law and um, Little's law here, um, and we actually also covered um, all of the calculating uh, or the basic measures. Um, the clock speed and the mix and stuff pretty well, I think. So. And I think I'll skip over that because while you can read about um, some of these for calculating benchmark results and things. So. Um, all right, so I think that's kind of all I wanted to really cover here. Um, anybody have any kind of uh, questions about anything? Going forward here, assignments or or other things. Um, if not, um, that was a pretty good session, I think. So, um, hopefully that was useful. Um, I'll get this posted. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've been having everybody attend these in, in, in a lot live, live uh, for the first two sessions. So I don't know if anybody really needs them um, offline, but I'll post it as usual. Um, the offer stands. I mean, this was kind of a, a one time thing that um, I needed to um, uh, do from the office here. But, but again, if, if anybody does, you know, um, uh, have a desire for uh, need some face to face time, whether for the lecture sessions or um, office meetings, you know, just shoot me an email, let me know. Um, or any other questions, you can always email me. So, all right, so that's it for the session. Um, and I will see you guys later then. <laughs>